sometimes it's not just about the destination, but also the incredible people we meet along the way. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Radiology Report podcast, where we are having conversations with the leaders transforming radiology today. You can find us on radiologyreportpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Daniel Arnold. Today, we are joined by Dr. Woojin Kim. Dr. Kim trained as a musculoskeletal radiologist and imaging informaticist. He is also a successful serial entrepreneur. He previously founded Montage, which revolutionized radiology search before being acquired by Nuance. His most recent company, Equium Intelligence, was in the non-interpretive AI space, helping radiologists with imaging demand forecasting, and was acquired by RadAI late last year. He now serves as the Chief Medical Information Officer at RadAI and works clinically part-time as a radiologist at the VA in Palo Alto. I'm personally so excited to have Dr. Kim on the show. For anyone that knows me and my interests, you are at the intersection of so many of them successful serial entrepreneur in radiology. You know, we've been building a company for some time. So super excited to have you on the show to share your perspective on all things radiology and tech and startups. It's going to be a fun conversation. Dr. Kim, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. So let's start in the early days of Dr. Kim. How did you, you know, where'd you grow up? How'd you wind up in, in radiology? Sure. Um, I was born in Korea and lived there until I was 11. Uh, my father believed, you know, I would do pretty well in the U.S. So he took a risk and moved the entire family first to Malaysia, where I went to school for a bit. And then we flew to Canada and took a Greyhound bus uh, to Los Angeles. But our early days, you know, early years in the U.S. were challenging as we lived uh, as undocumented immigrants. But, you know, we can save that story for another day. Through a small miracle and God's grace, I got into Brown, um, where I majored in neuroscience. So when I got into the University of Pennsylvania for med school, I thought for a long time that I would do something related to the human brain. So at first, I thought I would become a brain surgeon. But after spending about a month, you know, seeing what that's like, I realized that wasn't for me. In fact, one of the neurosurgery attendings gave me a piece of advice that I will never forget. He told me, imagine your favorite thing in the world is playing tennis and you're playing tennis on a Saturday. Suddenly you get a page saying you have to come into the hospital right away for surgery. So he told me if you can drop your racket right there and then and happily rush off to the hospital, then surgery is for you. But if you're not, then maybe you should think about another career path. <laughs> so that got me thinking. And I realized easily that, you know what, surgery wasn't for me. So next, you know, after that, I thought about, well, how about neurology or neuro-ophthalmology before finally deciding on radiology, probably because, you know, it was so technology heavy. And even in radiology, I first thought I would be a neuroradiologist, but I eventually ended up in musculoskeletal radiology. Now, it's kind of funny how life works because... You know, now I circle back to focusing on AI and neural networks. So I can tell you it's been a fun ride and I wouldn't change a thing. What an amazing story and you know, the immigrant story and entrepreneurship are are strongly linked. So I didn't know about your immigrant background. It's really, thanks for, for sharing that. And thanks to your dad for taking the risk that uh, yes. the radiology community is better off for it. So when did you get into computers? Was that also as a kid? Because so, so for those of you, we're, you know, we're going to get into your startup background and you built a lot of products. So in addition to your passion for medicine, you've had some sort of passion for computers and computer science. When was that fostered? Yeah, I wanted to begin by clarifying that I don't possess any formal background in computer science. In fact, my only brush with official, you know, computer science coursework was one semester of Pascal during my freshman year, which I never touched ever since. What I do have is a lifelong interest in computers that began at a very young age, as you suspected. So here's a little trip down memory lane that might reveal how old I am. Um, <laughs> my father actually gave me an Apple II uh, when I was a kid, um, and I vividly remember pouring over books and teaching myself how to code basic. And that sparked a lifelong interest that I carry with me to this day. 
So you were into it from a young age, but at the time you weren't thinking computer science, you were thinking medicine all the way. No, not even. In fact, like think, you know, when I was in college, uh, freshman year, I was thinking, you know, um, I wanted to either become a, a astronomer or an architect because I, I was really into art. Even to this day, mm. I'm really into art, as you'll see some of you know, my side projects. But um, yeah, I didn't really have any interest in medicine, I think, until about sophomore year in college. Okay. So you go into residency and then you decide you want to start a company. What happened? We hadn't talked about entrepreneurship yet. Was that something that you were always planning to do was to start a business or was it just sort of scratching your own itch? Tell us a little bit about, about your first entrepreneurial experience, Yadaluk. Yeah. So I can tell you, you know, to the question of, you know, did I always want to become an entrepreneur? And I would say not at all. In fact, the inception of all my startups has been, you know, rather serendipitous. It was always someone else who came to me and said, hey, we should turn this into a business. Uh, it was never my idea originally to turn something into a, a company. And I got into entrepreneurship because of other people around me, as you will hear throughout uh, as I share my experience. But having said that, I did discover later in my life that apparently my grandfather had been quite the entrepreneur um, before the Korean War. So it's possible that my entrepreneurial spirit is something that I might have inherited from him. So I could, so it was brewing uh, yeah. in, in your DNA, but you didn't know about it. You were all no, art, I didn't even know anything and, about it. <laughs> and science, and then it just turns out that when the entrepreneurship was switch was flipped, you had the skill programmed into you. I guess uh, so. ready to go. <laughs> yeah, and so I can tell you about Yadalok, um, which was my first entrepreneurial experience. Now, to answer that question, I have to take you back to my residency days. So. You know, as a first year resident on a musculoskeletal radiology rotations at the University of Pennsylvania, all of us had this one job that always was reserved for the first years, mainly because <laughs> no one else wanted to do it, right? So here's how it went. At that time, we had two DEXA scanners uh, stationed in two different buildings. Um, one was from GE Lunar and the other from Hologic. And every day around three o'clock in the afternoon, we had to take a trip to each of these scanners and collect the day's paper printouts, and then come back to our workstations. And from there on, we would manually dictate the data from the printouts into DEXA report templates, calling out numbers like minus 2.7, next field, osteoporosis, next field, and so on. Now, this process struck me as incredibly inefficient. You know, taking the digital data coming from the DEXA scanners, then you convert that to analog, you know, those paper <laughs> printouts, right? And then reverting it back to digital using speech recognition. And add to this, you know, the fact that if the speech recognition took down a wrong number, we would get a year full from endocrinologists the next day. So to me, this felt like a tremendous waste of time. And we spent literally about two hours every single day on a task we internally joked around, uh, calling it the DEXA Fellowship. Uh, by the MSK <laughs> section. And when I approached the manufacturers uh, for a solution, they actually came up empty. So I took it upon myself to find a workaround. It's more of a hack, if you will. I discovered by looking at the scanners that they use the basic, you know, mail merge technique in Microsoft Word using Visual Basic. So I taught myself just enough Visual Basic using the thinnest book I can find at a bookstore and to bypass the printing process entirely and directly transfer the digital reports coming out of the DEXA scanners into a share folder. And this allowed the residents to just simply copy, paste, and sign off the reports individually. So as a result, what was previously a couple hours of work now took just a few minutes. Now, this type of hacking caught the attention of Bill Boone, a co-resident of mine, who was a year junior to me, but had already undertaken an informatics fellowship during his residency. And he said, hey, buddy, if you like doing this kind of stuff, you should do an imaging informatics fellowship. Hmm. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know what that was uh, at the time. But, you know, he opened my eyes to the field. And after my residency, I stayed at Penn to complete a clinical fellowship in musculoskeletal radiology. And then I asked my fellowship director, hey, you know what, is it possible for me to spend my one academic day a week pursuing another fellowship at a different institution? 
And he said yes, uh, to my mm. surprise. And so I began, you know, my weekly commute on Amtrak uh, to Baltimore every Friday. And during that year, I taught myself how to code in PHP and noticed that Google was significantly lacking when it came to providing information that's useful for, you know, to radiologists. So, you know, the search engine nowadays has vastly improved since those days. But at that time, believe it or not, it was like, you know, it was returning pretty dismal results when searching for radiology images. So, for example, if you were looking for, say, mesothelioma, it would bring up primarily law firm websites, nothing to do with radiology. So I developed Yada Look, a search engine centered around radiology to address this gap during my fellowship year. And this venture later evolved into my first company. Great story. And there's so many serendipitous things that happened along yes. the way. What year was this imaging informatics fellowship? I'm surprised that they had this. Was like, is this something that was new at the time or was it well established? It was relatively new. Uh, in fact, uh, not to date myself, but it was, uh, I did my informatics fellowship between the years of 2006 and 2007. And I believe I was the second or third class to do it. Okay. And so, so very early in the, you know, in this process. Yes. And probably was not offered at too many institutions. At no. The time. In fact, at that time, pretty much everyone did their fellowship at the University of Maryland under, you know, doctors Elie Siegel, Khan Siddiqui, Nabil Saftar, and Paul Naji. And those four guys really, uh, you know, Taught me a lot, you know, got me started in imaging informatics. And they're all really giants in informatics today. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So one more question about the informatics. Do you remember yeah, like yes. what at that time were they thinking about? What were the problems of the day in radiology? Because you were off doing the search thing, but that wasn't, you know, what they were teaching, right? No. So, no. What, what, so the, the, what were the, they thinking about? You know, the format was unique. And my co-resident actually, Krishna Juluru, uh, is also, you know, a giant in the field now. So, you know, that particular program, actually, a lot of people came out of that uh, program uh, that you would recognize today. And every, you know, program every year, I think was different. But for me, because I was only able to do that one day a week, it was structured every Friday so that in the morning, I would learn the basics, like, you know, what's a sequel, you know, what's, you know, HL7, what's DICOM. So a lot of didactic and basic knowledge. And in the afternoon, we would, you know, spend time doing research projects. At that time, you know, we would look at, you know, computer vision, we would look at, you know, ergonomics and lots of other things. And we would generate a lot of abstracts. And, but at the same time, I think one experience that was unique to that particular fellowship was not only did we get the didactics and, you know, learn how to put that into practical use, but because it was one of those rare places uh, that did informatics, all these vendors would come. And I would sit there in the back and I would watch, you know, these vendors asking for advice and, you know, feedback on their, you know, IT projects. And I would see, you know, like Elliot and Khan and these guys, you know, Nabil, like, you know, providing feedback at the same time, you know, providing critiques. And I learned a lot just by watching that interaction. And so I think I got a lot of practical experience very early on. So that was extremely valuable. So it sounds like the initial idea for Yada Look was the lack of searchability on Google. Is that the same as the initial idea for Montage or did it kind of pivot? Tell me a little bit about the journey from Yada Look to Montage and you know what that first year was like getting that business off the ground. Yeah. So telling you a little bit more about Yada Look, I mean, looking back, I have to admit, you know, my knowledge of the startup scene was embarrassingly small. I mean, you know, now I recognize it. Yet every step and every stumble was a learning experience. And Yada Look was my introduction to the startup world. In retrospect, I think one of our strengths was that we remain you know, mindful of our capabilities. Um, we didn't bite off more than we can chew. In fact, Yada Look was conceived with you know particular goal in mind, which was to serve an, you know, as an educational tool accessible to individuals across the globe. And it wasn't really designed primarily to be a money-making machine at the time or ever, actually. Rather, we took, you know, really great pride in how it facilitated easy access to valuable information for many folks who might have, you know, otherwise struggled to find it. And given this intent, you know, we didn't seek, you know, substantial funding or, you know, strive to generate, you know, hefty revenue. 
In fact, we just aspire to make just enough money to keep the lights on. And that experience taught me what it's like to develop a product that many people use and appreciate. But it also drove home the fact that, you know, a product's popularity doesn't necessarily guarantee its profitability. Those two things often coincide, but not always. And later, iVirtuoso, which was the company behind Yadalook, was acquired by Montage. But the coding skills I honed and the lessons I learned while building a search engine paved the way for my next venture, which was, you know, Montage Healthcare Solutions. And by the way, for the listeners, in case you're wondering about the name, uh, Yada at the time was the largest decimal unit prefix after Google, uh, but that was theoretical. That denoted 10 to 24. And it was sort of a play on the phrase, you ought to look. So that's how the name came about, <laughs> Yada. And so that uh, was my first startup. And as far as, you know, um, how Montage uh, got started, I can tell you, you know, I was sitting in my office, racking my brain over an interesting MRI case that I dictated about three weeks ago. But I couldn't remember the patient's name, medical record number, or accession number. All I can recall were the specific details that I included in the report, yet, you know, retrieving that report was extremely challenging. And this was back in 2009, speaking of, you know, timing. And as a radiologist, I found it absurd that, you know, we lack the means to search our internal radiology information systems with the same ease and efficiency as a Google search on the internet. And, you know, there was a starting big difference between, you know, one's ability to retrieve information within hospital systems versus, you know, outside on the web. So, you know, given the significance of healthcare, you know, this seemed like a missed opportunity to me. So, you know, having previously developed a search engine uh, through Yadalok, I decided to take matters into my own hands and created a, you know, really basic search engine against the risk, uh, which we named Presto, uh, an acronym for Pathology Radiology Enterprise Search Tool. And we showcased this search engine in several academic presentations and after every talk, someone would invariably approach us after each session asking, hey, can you install that at our institution? So, you know, remember Bill, you know, who got me into informatics? Well, it was Bill who recognized the commercial potential of Presto. And, you know, this recognition laid the groundwork for what later evolved into Montage. So in a sense, you know, Montage owes its conception to a radiologist frustration and uh, a little tool we call Presto at the time. And as you can tell, I owe Bill for many of my life's decisions. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like, again, this came from you scratching an itch before it became a business. This was you tinkering and yep. then eventually finding some commercial opportunities. As you started to think about building a company around it, were you worried that this was something that Google would just do? I, I remember at the time I was sharing with you earlier about my Google experience, there was a lot of emphasis on Google powering internal search for enterprises. I think they realized at the end of the day, I think you can probably still do it, but it's not very good and it's not a big enough market for them. And they, they kind of shied away from it. But at the time, that must have been a scary thought. It was, uh, especially during the Yadalook days, because you know Google could have created its own version, I'm sure, in a very short period of time, but they never did actually. You know, yeah. So even though you know we were concerned about it, and that's something you always have to think about, right? So when you create a solution, you have to look at the competition, you have to look at the incumbents, and you always have to take that into account. And yeah, we definitely thought about, you know, especially the Yadda look days, uh, whether, you know, Google is just going to come up with their own, you know, radiology version, but they never did. And so that was fortunate. And I got to learn a lot by doing that. And, you know, even in healthcare, you would think that they can potentially come in and, you know, provide, say, search engine for the EMR. But even to this day, you know, that doesn't really exist. So, yeah, so we were fortunate that they didn't go. Well, into and that. I imagine the, the product had enough radiology eccentricities that provide so much value to a narrow audience that Google would never think about. I want modality filters and I want historical filters and whatever you could imagine a bunch of different, not overly complex things. But things that are so specific to radiology that Google just would never get there, nor care to, because the market's so so small exactly. relative to Google, but the market's big exactly. enough for you know a few friends to to make a decent size 
business. So what was the first year like, you know, not from the product's inception, but from the, all right, guys, you know, we're doing this, we're going to try and sell it to people and, you know, incorporate. What was the first year like as, you know, big boy business? Yeah, and I can tell you about the founding team. So uh, Bill Boone, Kurt Langlotz, Raj Agarwal, and me, we're the co-founders, and we're all radiologists. And I made the minimum viable product that folks at Penn were already using. In fact, speaking of the first year, we had one paying customer the first year, and the first hospital that actually paid for it was uh, using a version that I coded. And Kurt had startup experiences, so he played the role of a wise, you know, mentor, providing invaluable guidance throughout the company's journey. And Raj, our resident MBA holder, uh, devised the <laughs> original business plan. And <laughs> Bill and I were, you know, mainly responsible for day-to-day -day operations and, you know, from conducting sales demos to handling, you know, client queries. Now, our first hire, John Paulette, uh, took our MVP and completely rewrote it in Python in the early days which meant that I also had to learn Python now as well so that I can continue contributing to the code base and the algorithms. But looking back, I'm extremely grateful for having learned Python as it opened new doors for me and has proven to be an essential tool in modern machine learning, as you can tell. Absolutely. So Startup 101 is, you know, hire people with complementary skill sets. You did not follow Startup 101. You start your company with four radiologists with the same skills, but somehow you decide to divide and conquer. Eventually you hire an, an engineer. They start building some product. How did you go about getting sales traction? How did people find out about you? Did Were you making the sales and doing the, the, the contracting? Did you have a sales team at some point? Like, what was the business model like? Any way we could is the <laughs> short answer I can tell you. And a lot of it was organic and through word of mouth. And as mentioned in the early days, Bill and I would like give talks on the topic of search engines, you know, as a part of academic talks. And people would come up to ask if we could install Montage at their place. So that's, you know, definitely um, got the word of mouth going. And then throughout the life of the company, Bill and I, we gave a lot of demos. And we exhibited at lots of conferences. And one of our early hires, Brandon Smith, played a key role when it came to getting sales traction. And believe it or not, that was it from a sales team from the early days to until we got acquired. So we didn't have a huge sales team, actually. Yeah. So then during this time, were you still a faculty uh, yes. or on staff at Penn? Yes. That's also a strategic advantage. In some ways, you've got a salary coming in, so you don't have to raise capital to pay for the founding team's salaries. And you can go to a conference and you know that's part of your job too. And you have academic time. So that's that's a little bit of a unique setup, if I understand correctly, but also some some drawbacks. You know, how how yes. did you think about starting a company while while being, you know, faculty? Great question. In fact, uh, the question about, you know, navigating the delicate balance between academia and entrepreneurship is one I get asked a lot, particularly when I speak about my journey at lectures and seminars. So first and foremost, you must be aware of and adhere to the rules. In that regard, you know, the faculty handbook was an invaluable resource for me that I religiously followed when I was at Penn. I began by disclosing my invention to the technology transfer office at the very beginning. And I can tell you, uh, secondly, documentation is absolutely vital. And I mean everything, including, you know, what laptop you use and when and, and so forth. Now, in my particular case, University of Pennsylvania concluded after looking at my invention that it had no intellectual property. So they returned it to me. You know, looking back, I was extremely lucky, but I doubt this will happen nowadays. That being said, in my experience, most academic centers don't excel at nurturing and promoting startups. So if your venture, however, requires extensive university resources, then it may be necessary and worthwhile. But I'll tell you, in many circumstances and for a lot of people, it's not a course I usually recommend to other folks. So if you're someone who has an idea and you're a fellow, you'd say, keep the idea in your back pocket until you finish fellowship and start it you know, when you start your private practice job or, you know, however else you're you're thinking about funding your life and startup mm -hmm. journey? Yeah, in fact, I would actually, um, you know, really ask the 
question. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if somebody came up to me with that type of question, I would say I would take it even a step further, potentially, uh, even though this may sound sort of hypocritical since I actually was an attending physician for a while, not taking salary before, you know, going full time into the company. But I actually ask nowadays, you know, instead of working on nights and weekends, are you willing to give up your daytime job to devote yourself 100% to this? Now, there are two thoughts about this. You know, some people say that's too much. You don't have to do that. And some people uh, say, you know, that tells you, you know, what level of commitment and, you know, passion and belief that you have about your product. So, you know, I'm not saying that you have to do one or the other, but I've actually asked just to see, get a sense of, you know, potential, you know, when I did angel investments, just to see the level of commitment, you know, what their willingness was. But I'll tell you, in general, physicians have a hard time going all in. And I can't fault them because I also didn't do that myself. But it does tell me how much they believe in their product potentially as well. It makes me think of a few things. One, I think back to the tennis example you gave earlier. If you could drop the tennis racket immediately and go into surgery, mm -hmm. could apply to startup jobs as well. You certainly, there's going to be a lot of moments like that. Yeah. I wonder, did you ever consider leaving Penn at that time to go full-time at Montage? I did. I did. In fact, I actually gradually uh, reduced my time at Penn. I first became part-time. And then when I realized that, you know, once you go part-time, you lose your all your academic standings and you are no longer on the academic track, I realized, well, then I might as well just, you know, go full-time into the industry. So I actually quit Penn just before we were acquired and I was spending 100% of my time there. So, you know, having done both ways, I will tell you there's no one right path. And yeah. But for some folks, like you said, you know, doing this on nights and weekends doesn't mean that you don't have passion for it or that you don't believe in the project. I think, you know, there are many different pathways. So I would say, you know, as long as you want to do it, uh, you should definitely try giving it a shot. And I would only say that, you know, be willing to take some risk. I think being willing to take the risk is the big thing. One of the, so when I was in business school, all the big companies would come to recruit and I wouldn't go to the recruiting events. And my wife at med school at the time was like, so you're just not even going to like interview or apply for jobs or anything. And I was like, well, no, because if I go and I interview, I'm going to get a job, confident person, <laughs> and it's going to be a lot of money. And then I'm not going to be able to turn it down. And then I'm not going to be able to pursue my dreams. <laughs> and one of the challenges that radiologists face are all physicians is you can very quickly go from having no money to having lots of money. And then having lots of money going back to having no money is hard. And so thankfully I've never had any money. I've put that off for some time, partly knowing that my wife's going to be a doctor. So I, I'll be okay in the long term. but it's hard. I think it's harder to leave that job and take that entrepreneurial risk once you, you know, have that big salary. Yeah. And I'll tell you, you know, I was single when I was, you know, uh, when Montage got acquired. So you know, for me, it, I, I had a lot of flexibility and I could yep. take a risk, right? I mean, worst case scenario, I could eat noodles for six months. I mean, that's something, you know, I could do. So I think everyone's in different situations, but I will tell you, yeah, you're right. I mean, it is difficult to take risk as your salary increases and, you know, more life, other responsibilities. Yeah, your kids, uh, you, yeah. <laughs> you can't send your kids to daycare on, on equity. So that's right. Uh, <laughs> it's It's tough. Okay, so uh, back to montage, and then we'll, we'll yeah. get into the next one. Last question on on montage. So startup ideas, they pivot, they evolve. Tell me a little bit about from the initial idea to the acquisition, how did the product evolve, grow, change? Yeah, so montage started off initially as a search engine, which was immensely beneficial for academic sites because of its you know significant utility for research and education. And the product was pretty easy to market in this segment, but we recognized early on that this market was limited. So, you know, we diversify Montage's capabilities early on, introducing operational analytics, such as, you know, analyzing our use and volume. However, the uh -huh. landscape for operational analytics solutions was getting crowded. So to stand out, we subsequently focused on analytics capabilities for unstructured report text data by combining, you know, natural language processing with analytics. So, you know, because of 
we did that, we were able to offer a range of unique analytics that were typically absent in other operational analytic solutions. So for example, you know, Montage was able to track critical results and notifications, you know, detect laterality and sex errors in radiology reports and spot billing errors arising from incomplete documentation. You know, for example, like forgetting to mention the aorta in a complete abdominal ultrasound exam. And as part of this development, we began to detect, you know, follow recommendations in reports as well, long before this particular topic became a hot topic in radiology. And so this type of sort of, you know, proactively anticipating future trends and needs help Montage maintain its competitive, you know, edge. So... I was going to ask, but now I understand so much better why it made sense for Nuance, uh, now Microsoft, but at the time Nuance to buy you. But it sounds like as you became integrated into the reporting workflow, that you know became a real value add for Nuance. Was it just an aqua hire? Were they buying and, and scaling your products? You know, what was the acquisition like? Yeah, so Montage was started in 2010, and we were acquired in 2016. And during those six years, Montage grew to be installed at over 500 different sites, both in U.S. and Canada. And, you know, as many listeners know, Nuance is well known for its reporting product, Parscribe, which most radiologists in the U.S. use to dictate and generate radiology reports. But put simply, you know, we had a product that analyzed radiology reports. So there was a natural synergy between the two products and companies. And Nuance was our actually one of our earliest reseller. And oh. that partnership grew over the years, and they eventually acquired us when they were ready to incorporate radiology report analytics into their product portfolio. And one time, I'll tell you a story, the CEO of one of our competitors stopped me uh, in the exhibit floor to tell me that, you know what, partnering with Nuance early was a brilliant move on your part. <laughs> so, you know, he was very congratulatory, uh, which was great. And Often you see companies, small companies get bought out by big companies and the product that got acquired experiences a slow death. And you see this often. And this is a real disservice to the customers and a detriment to innovation that made the product initially attractive for acquisition in the first place. So I have to give, uh, with that said, I have to give Nuance a lot of credit for their efforts to keep growing the product. In fact, they grew the team even bigger and expanded into other countries like Australia following the Is it still called Montage or did they fold it into their sort of reporting product line? Yeah. So <laughs> one of the first things they do when a company buys you out is they rebrand the product. So <laughs> um, not surprisingly, they like the word power. So um, it's actually Empower. <laughs> so got it, Empower got it. So it became a core name. part of their product suite in yes. many ways. That's really an amazing, amazing story. And you know, just reading about what do founders do after a successful exit and the bar to start a second company, or in this case, you're, you're a, a third company, but a second successful company is hard. A lot of people, they decide they want to like do something totally different, like open a restaurant or, you know, <laughs> a hotel, you know, I can't do this anymore in my industry, but you still love radiology. So uh, yes. you and Bill, you get back together, the original band, and you come up with a new idea. Tell us a, a little bit about Equium Intelligence. Yeah, so my co-founder Bill and I spent over three years at Nuance after the acquisition. Our customers loved our product and their satisfaction was our priority. And I also wanted to give a shout out to one of our early hires, you know, Alec Grobeski on the customer support. And all of us, we felt responsible for ensuring its ongoing support and development after the company was acquired. So Bill and I stuck around for a smooth transition and carried out many of the same tasks we, you know, handled at our previous company, Montage. And we actually stayed even longer than initially agreed upon as we wanted to see our product thrive and, you know, have a smooth transition. So now, you know, talking about Equium, at Equium, we created an application that uses AI for demand forecasting and capacity planning specifically for radiology. So imagine being able to predict that, you know, your section will encounter 287 exams next Thursday and that your radiologist scheduled to work that day will be close to their maximum capacity. And if you knew that, you can plan ahead by scheduling, say, an extra radiologist, like 
Dr. Jones for a few hours to handle the load. And imagine it being able to also alert you about a certain surge of cases in the next four hours that could risk your existing service level agreement. And with this early warning, you can take action proactively rather than, you know, being reactionary, which is what happens mostly today. And, you know, finally, incorporating AI in terms of resource management, it can give you predictive and prescriptive analytics to optimize your MR scanners used to fit more patients. And that's Equium in a nutshell. And it was our attempt to bring the power of AI to radiology for smarter and more efficient operations. And in terms of how we got started, we actually got started with five co-founders. Uh, so three of us, Bill, John, our first hire, and I were from the Montage days. And when we were in Montage, Greg Couch and John Aziaski had a startup called Reddit Metrics. And we thought it would be great to incorporate DICOM data into clinical analytics. So we thought about and contemplated joining forces at that time, but then, you know, buyer, you know, acquired them. So that never came to fruition. So when we left Nuance uh, at the end of, you know, 2019, we thought, you know, it'd be really cool to be able to work together. So Greg had a scheduling solution already being used. So we initially started the company with the intention of AI enabling physician scheduling before moving to demand forecasting, capacity planning, and resource management. So you start this company and, you know, you've been giving a lot of talks, helping educate the world on AI and radiology and one way you can break down the world is interpretive AI versus non-interpretive AI. And if I can speak for you and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you're really bullish on non-interpretive AI use cases, even more so yes. than interpretive AI use cases. So interpretive AI being, you know, the AI helping you read a brain MRI and telling you what the diagnosis is. Turns out radiologists are really good at that. Um, but there's so many other parts of the operational workflow from billing to scheduling to uh, report generation, you name it, that... AI is really going to help a lot with. And so this was your your attempt in this non-interpretive AI space. Do you agree with that sort of overview? Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I've been giving a lot of talks on the topic of non-interpretive AI. And I always, you know, preface it by saying everyone knows about the interpreter use cases. The whole reason we got into, you know, this deep learning, how that took off, you know, all was related to computer vision and you know, the natural, you know, correlate in, in medicine was radiology. So, you know, it's very easy to make that connection and see why so many people are excited about that particular use case. But, you know, I talk about how I wrote a blog piece a long, long time ago for ACR, where I talk about, you know, hey, guys, I want to warn you not to have a tunnel vision when it comes to AI and radiology. Because if you look at the imaging value chain, Yes, you know, interpretation is important, but it's just one piece of the imaging value chain. And there's so many other pieces that AI can, you know, benefit. So I kind of, you know, wanted folks to say, okay, well, that's great. You know, we got two, 300 companies, you know, doing computer vision in radiology, but there's a whole bunch of other opportunities uh, within radiology that I think AI can play a role in, i.e. non-interpretive AI. So you start Equium Intelligence and then... As I understand it, pretty quickly thereafter, joined forces with Rad AI, maybe more quickly than you anticipated. And as you're describing the business, so so my company, Modality, our head of sales came from a company called QGenda. So I thought for sure, based on what you described, that like you'd sell to <laughs> QGenda or something. I imagine that was that'd be a natural landing point. Uh, so QGenda is a radiology scheduling started as a radiology scheduling software to help schedule a radiologist on the different shifts has grown into every specialty. So now an entire hospital system can schedule their anesthesia and their surgeries. The whole team gets scheduled on yeah. QGenda, but pretty much every radiologist that's been through residency at least has, has used QGenda. I think they probably have 90% plus market share. So how did you find your way to Rad AI? You chuckled when I mentioned QGenda. So I <laughs> imagine they were someone you thought about quite a bit. Bring me inside. Yeah. So as you mentioned, you know, we had a physician, you know, staff scheduling application that was commercialized and to, you know, rewind a little bit. So at RSNA 2021, we showed a prototype of our AI driven demand forecasting and resource management application. And the responses were more than we anticipated. So we completed the commercial version and released it as SIM, you know, 2022. But soon after, you know, we announced the product, you know, we were approached by Red AI and were subsequently acquired. And the response initially was far beyond what we expected. 
we didn't expect the level of excitement and interest that it would generate and people loved it and that's what fueled our passion and you know that's what drove us to you know bring the application to its full version by you know uh sim 22 but you know we barely had time like you said had time to ramp up the sales process when red ai a company renowned in radiology and ai approached us and they saw the value and potential of our team and the product and before we knew it we were a part of their team yeah so help me see the connections because I saw the connection more clearly yeah. with Nuance and PowerScribe and Montage. What's the connection between demand forecasting or other sorts of scheduling applications and what Rad AI does? That Rad AI has rolled out a lot of products, but best known for their report generation, auto impression work. So how did that fit into their product strategy? Yeah, so it's fascinating how timing plays a pivotal role in someone's entrepreneurial journey. And, you know, according to our original roadmap, I'll be honest, we'd probably still be navigating the course with Equium, but, you know, sometimes destiny has its own plans. And the demand forecasting concept we introduced was a, like I said, it was a massive hit. It resonated with people, but then an intriguing question started cropping up, which is where does this fit into the workflow? And it's a question that I actually asked the companies I advise as well. And what surprised us was that they often be able to answer their own question by saying, you know what, this would be perfect in a workless product. Mm. So that planted a seed and we started contemplating internally, you know, should we build our own workless product? And it was an exciting prospect, but also at the same time, you know, as you can imagine, a significant undertaking. And then as if on cue, Red AI entered the scene. And faced with the choice of either collaborating with an established player or forging our own path, we had some serious thinking to do. But, you know, as we dug deeper, it was clear there was a compelling synergy between the two companies and the puzzle pieces seemed to fit together nicely. So that's how our new chapter in our journey began by looking at this and we're like, okay, well, you know what? Yeah, we need an outlet for demand forecasting and capacity planning and workless product is a natural conduit to fit into the overall workflow. And Red AI already had their workless product Nexus. So we thought, hey, this would be a nice fit. Awesome. So we'll have to have you back on in the future to hear how the Red AI journey unfolds. It sounds like there's still so much work to be done to build and scale that product. The journey you've had with one co-founder partner might be a good place for us to wrap things up because we're long on time is... Tell us about this special partnership. I think so many people wonder how to build a team, how to build a partnership, and what you and Bill have done is really special. Who does what and you know what's made this such a productive relationship? Yeah, so here's a tale that gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, it's a small world. So I want you to picture this. Bill and I, both at Brown University, both of us majoring in neuroscience, breathing the same academic air. But here's the kicker. We didn't cross paths then, not even once when we were at Brown. (laughs) Uh, We were one year apart, but that kept us in different spaces. And so fast forward a bit, we find ourselves at Penn and in residency and this time in the same space. And it's there that we finally got connected. And it feels like we've known each other for ages. And of course, you know, you've heard the exciting chapters that, you know, followed since then, you know, about how Bill played a key role in shaping my career and you know, how he was the one who nudged me into informatics fellowship and guided me toward the dynamic world of startups. So, you know, sometimes it's not just about the destination, but also the incredible people we meet along the way. And, you know, in terms of our skill sets and our dynamic, it's quite interesting. While I've taken on leadership roles before, like, you know, when I was the division chief of MSK at Penn, but if I were to be honest with you, administrative tasks are not my cup of tea. Instead, You know, I find my stride in the technical realm, you know, wrestling with complex problems and architecting solutions that make a difference. Now, Bill, on the other hand, thrives in those administrative realms. He enjoys overseeing operations, managing teams, and tackling all those executive tasks. And it's really genuinely impressive to watch. And I think that's the crux of our synergy. We both can deep dive into medicine and informatics, but when it comes to driving a company forward, we have our distinct lanes that we stay in. Bill, with his exceptional leadership skills, is naturally the CEO every time, steering the company. In fact, one of the most 
proud things I can share about Montage is that in the six and a half years we had, you know, that company, anyone who joined our company as a full-time employee did not leave the company until we were acquired. So wow. no one left. And that tells a lot about, you know, Bill's leadership style and management skills. And for me, you know, I wear a title just because it's necessary, but I'll be honest, my heart is in the engine room, let's say, you know, my joy comes from innovation, you know, from the thrill of crafting new solutions, bringing fresh ideas to life. And so together, Bill and I, I think we strike a balance that keeps the wheels turning. And I believe that's the secret to our success. Well, a really special partnership and a really special career. So two areas that I would love to continue to pick your brain over time are the search thing we talked about, your experience at search, our search is so bad. I don't know how to solve that problem. <laughs> but more pressingly, like what, you know, how do we think about AI? And and I think, so our education business is all focused on what the doctor in Kansas needs to know today. And so how do we think about AI when it's not live yet? You yes. know, it, 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 I it, thought it, about that. And I'll tell you, I thought your interview with Nina Kotler was terrific. And it's really wonderful to add more dimension to the narrative of, you know, discussing the non-interpretive AI today with you. And, you know, thinking about this adding AI, I think trust is a crucial cornerstone when it comes to the world of AI. And, you know, for AI to make strides in the clinical world, this trust issue needs to be really thoroughly addressed. And speaking of modality and, you know, how you can incorporate, you know, one of the things that I thought about was, the reason why I really enjoy Nina's, you know, interview is because she provides that, you know, what it's like to implement AI in the actual world, uh, the practical aspects of AI implementation. So I think that's what a lot of our colleagues need to hear and to be educated on. But as far as education itself, I think one of the things that you probably want to I don't know if you've seen it. Um, have you watched this TED Talk by Sal Khan from Khan Academy? The most recent one? Yeah, the most recent one. Oh, it's so good. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, when I'm thinking about you guys, that was what I was thinking like, yeah, there's got to be a way to incorporate this AI into your educational products and educational offerings. And I think, you know, what they're doing at Duolingo and, you know, Khan Academy, I think there is possibility of something like that for you guys. Yeah, so it's it's so interesting. That's it, great that you listened to the talk with Nina. She's amazing, and I learned so much from her. She's great. So there's basically two angles. One is AI to make our application better. Like, how are we yeah. as a company using AI to make our That's products right. better? Which is a separate conversation. Versus how do we teach AI? Like, what's our point of view on AI? And right now, AI is so vendor specific that when you teach it, so the trust component's important. But if you teach it right now, it ends up being super vendor specific. You actually kind of erode that trust even a little bit. And so, and I don't know, this must be what's happened in the past in radiology. I'm, I'm not a historian, but I imagine you had GE or whomever pushing MR and saying, this is going to be really important. And so then you need the clinicians out there talking about how they're using MR. And I'm yeah. trying to think back to what these other seismic shifts were like 30 years ago and you know, what role we play in it and how to get those points across. Yeah, but, you know, with all the excitement around generative AI, I think it, it's going to renew the interest in this space. And so I think it will give, you know, it's, it's a perfect time to reevaluate, revamp AI education. But to your point, you're right. I mean, you have to strike a balance between, you know, not being too vendor specific, but at the same time, you know, what you read in an academic journal doesn't necessarily translate to the real world oftentimes. And that's why there's a disconnect and why people don't, you know, apply and not interested in learning those kinds of things. But whenever I give talks on AI, I always try to strike a balance between hype and reality. And I think things like what Nina talks about is, is important because it tells you what you need to look out for, all the pitfalls. And so I think that's what people need to know. Yes, you need to know how this stuff works, but at a you know high level is good enough for a lot of folks, but all the ways that it can go wrong. And that's yeah. the thing, one way we can educate them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we left a lot for a future conversation. So I look forward to connecting again soon. And Dr. Woo Jin Kim, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much. It was fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Radiology Report podcast. Be sure to visit us at the radiologyreportpodcast.com or subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts to join us for our next episode. We are always looking for great guests 
If you have someone you'd like to hear on the show, please get in touch with us online.